Hello, hello. We have five more movies to discuss. My top five from the previous decade. Starting out with something very, very different than anything else on this list in terms of demographic and medium and budget and audience and uh, box office haul. <laughs> very extreme in all of those categories. Uh, the only entry on this list from the Disney, Fox, Marvel, LucasArts, hyperglomerate disgusting ass thing. We're talking about Inside Out, my favorite Pixar movie. I think this is the greatest Pixar movie simply as a Pixar movie. And this is saying a lot because Pixar is really, really good at what they do. Um, but I, I think this is the one that does it best. Uh, so, so what is it that I, I describe as like a Pixar movie? We have an action-packed romp through a delightful and imagination-sparking world. You know, in, in WALL-E, they went through the ruins of Earth and space and the, the future human civilization ship, and that was fantastic. In Finding Nemo, they explored the, the ocean and all of its beautiful delights and mysteries and variants. In uh, Monsters, Inc., they had this amazing society of monsters that they, they built up so in-depth and enriched. But I think this is the best one in terms of uh, just how genius it is, in terms of how multifaceted it is. The world of the imagination itself. How, how can you top that? It's just the brain. And, and the action is great. The, the characters are great. They're lovable no matter how small their parts are. Just all these little workers within the brain are so charming and delightful. There's a great mix of, of the humor being that kind of classic irreverent dialogue where they're arguing about who has had it is, or just kind of the charm of this bizarre brain job being treated like a normal job. And then, of course, really wacky slapstick for the kids. It's truly something for everyone. Um, Pixar, of, of course, I think is fantastic and uh, just making something fun for the parents, too. It's a very cliche thing to say, but... Uh, the movie is really genuinely funny, I think, even for an adult. The soundtrack is very stirring, the visuals are just absolutely dazzling, the voice work is great, I think Amy Poehler especially is just genius casting. This is everything that you want from a big budget movie. This is like why they should spend a lot of money on movies. Not just to have 500,000 CGI robots fight 500,000 CGI Iron Man, I don't know, but but just like a lot of love put into it, a lot of detail and imagination and, and just a, a visual ecstasy. Um, that's, that's what I want to see. That's what I'm okay with them spending a billion dollars on. Not friggin' punch each other. Anyways, <laughs> but then also, on top of it being my favorite Pixar as Pixar movie, it's also a great example of, a, of another genre of movie that I really love, a, a family drama. Um, I made a joke about this before, <laughs> that I, I really love movies where it, it could be summarized as a family and then something bad happens. Uh, a great example is a movie that almost made the list, uh, Force Majeure, uh, by the same director as The Square, where it's a family, they're on a ski trip, things seem okay, if not great, then something happens, <laughs> something bad happens, and everything just goes to hell. Everything just kind of crumbles away. And, uh, and I think, you know, that's a good way to tell a story. I, I'll watch almost any movie that's a family and something bad happens. And, and Inside Out, it nails it. <laughs> it's pretty standardized. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing really inventive, inventive about the, the family plot. But it's still really substantial, too. Really well characterized, very well drawn out with all these little scenes building up the atmosphere, building up the mood. Um, given that it's less than half the movie, given that it's, I don't know, maybe like 30 minutes total of running time, um, I'm really impressed with, with how hard they worked on this. It's so far outside of Pixar's normal, like, wheelhouse, too, to just depict a, a tense and sad family drama. <laughs> it's amazing. There's a very touching and very important lesson in it about opening up about your sadness, about coming to people close to you. When you're depressed, when you're struggling, and being open and honest, it's really beautiful. It made me bawl my eyes out. Um, and, and I think thinking about kids watching this, thinking about kids that are the age of the main character watching this, it's really beautiful to me that they can maybe learn that lesson. A lesson that a lot of people don't learn well into their adulthood, if at all. 
um, but something that's so, so, so important for everyone involved to just be open about these things. But then, on top of this, on top of that, finally, also too, it's a really interesting neurological exploration of consciousness. It, it's truly fascinating to think about this as an actual model of the brain. Um, and, and, and it's kind of accurate, too. <laughs> There's no, like, uh, omniscient soul part of the mind. There's no, like, one central agent that controls everything. Um, there's no specific seat of individuality or consciousness. Um, it's clear that the vast majority of things happening in her life are subconscious, that the, uh, everyone within the brain only has like a dim awareness of certain things that are happening. Um, and all of this lines up with how consciousness actually works. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not a neurobiologist or anything, but I, I, I like reading about this stuff. I like reading articles about advancements in neurology. I read books like um, like Thinking Fast and Slow is a, is a very classic, very popular scientific book uh, that gives a lot of insights onto how the mind works. Um, same with, uh, this one is a little more controversial and out there, uh, Julian Jaynes, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Uh, one of my favorite books, I think it's just amazingly fascinating and evocative and, and just rich with ideas. Uh, whether or not you believe the theories he espouses, it really uh, compellingly examines, okay, how is the mind working? Like, let's think about it empirically. Like, what is going on um, in the mind to produce the behavior of people? Uh, another book I read recently, Other Minds, uh, it looks at the intelligence of, of octopuses and how it relates to our intelligence, having split off so early, kind of independently and in evolving uh, intelligence in two different experiments. Anyways, I, all I'm trying to say here is that I, I have a lot of ideas about this sort of stuff, even if I wouldn't consider myself an expert. Um, and having sought out, like, like, books that are just specifically about this like for adults <laughs> this is still up there this is still also a very interesting compelling idea in that same category to me which i think is awesome because it's a kids movie <laughs> and and i don't know i wish i could have seen this when i was a little kid i, I think it would have just blown my mind and maybe i would have been a neurosurgeon now or something <laughs> anyways um, it's really, really fun to, uh, to think of the de-metaphorized version of everything that's happening. Um, and, it, and it always matches up that, that it always corresponds to something in real life. Uh, <laughs> sometimes via like charming puns in terms of phrases and stuff, but uh, you can do it. And it's, it's really compelling to, to try to see um, how everything is reflected. And uh, they have a whole lot of fun with the gimmick of, of jumping into other people's minds and seeing their own little uh, emotion center agents and stuff. I, I think that's really, really funny. And I, and I wish that there was just hours and hours of that. Like they, they made like a TV show or a sitcom or something where you just bounced around between people's minds. Oh, that was it? Oh, I thought I had another point. Anyways, it's a really good movie. It's my favorite Pixar movie. And, and I love Pixar movies generally, so... Check it out if you haven't. I imagine most people that are interested in seeing this would have already seen it. Um, but at the same time, it's not like one of the big Pixar classics. Like, there's certainly never going to be, like, a sequel. There's not very much merch of it. Um, so, yeah, I wish it was appreciated a little more. It's a very, very special movie. Okay. Moving right along. Something completely different. Old man looking at old statue. This is The Great Beauty. Uh, an Italian film. The Italian title is like La Grande Bella Zita or something. I don't know. I'm not going to try to speak other languages. <laughs> this is a series of nearly hallucinatory glimpses into the high society of Rome. This is by the same director as Youth. And I would say that if Youth kind of looked at the Alps through the perspective of this composer and filmmaker, these friends, and, and what they appreciate, what they take in, then here we look through Rome with the eyes of a writer. And, uh, you know, to, to me, who thinks of herself as some sort of writer, uh, this is a very compelling idea. And as, as someone who's a fan of these big ancient cities and stuff. Uh, this is truly the apex of this literary lifestyle that I spent most of my teens and early 20s really romanticizing that someday I will be a famous, critically acclaimed author. I'll live somewhere like Paris or Rome, 
I'll, I'll be the talk of the town. I'll attend all of these parties. Everyone will know my name. I once fantasized about things like that. Eh. <laughs> now I could take it or leave it. <laughs> What's so good about it? And, and a lot of this movie really is asking that question. Well... Really, what's so good about this? <laughs> there really is. There's little left to romanticize in this version of Rome. Do you get my joke here? Romanticize Rome. This is why I. Uh, this is why they call me a writer. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, let me settle down. There's this this frivolousness, this falseness, the failure of of every oh, nearly every endeavor that we witness throughout this movie. There's a huge complex web of, of undercutting some people and dazzling other people. There's a very mysterious socioeconomic hierarchy of, of who respects who, who has to suck up to who, who totally transcends the world that who lives in. Um, and, the, and as I said, this is something that I, I like in, in any sort of story that really fascinates me. And, and here I think is one of my favorites. Um, Certain characters, especially, that we only see little glimpses of. Um, it's the scene where he, he goes, Hello, princesses. And you're like, are those princesses? <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's very, very fascinating, very complex, um, and kind of forms the, the foundation of the whole movie. At both the top and the bottom is our protagonist, uh, the, the writer, um, who's uh, navigating all of it with sometimes kind of unclear motivations and a very polarizing charm that some people hate him, some people love him, some people... And some viewers will hate him, some viewers will love him. Um, it is a very complex, very human, very three-dimensional portrait. And yet, breaking through all this futility, all of this falseness, all of this performance, all of this sense of... of putting on airs to, to try to justify your social standing. Um, what bursts through from that is, is what you could call the great beauty of this film. A variety of, of performances and projects and, and lives lived artistically. The, the art of living life, as my friend texted me in all caps recently. <laughs> um, uh, they're, they're just kind of given to the viewer as if you were seeing them in a gallery. To, to explore, to, to let yourself think. You know, what, what resonates with me? Is this beautiful to me? Does this instill something in me? Is this phony? You know, is this meaningful? Is this beautiful? It's really up to you. There's so many different scenes like this where, where he, he watches a performance or he meets someone and you kind of learn about their lives. Um, he just goes and looks at a statue it's like, what? It's, it's totally up to you. <laughs> Which of these are beautiful? But I, I think for everyone, there'll be some moment in the scene that just touches you so deeply. Um, some of these sequences where he's just kind of appreciating art, and you, the viewer as well, are allowed a, a totally uninhibited uh, immersion in this art um, that I, I return to them in isolation. I just watch those sequences and, and kind of bask in it and then just uh just the feeling of there is some great beauty out there there is some artistic project that that can overcome all of this this futility that can overcome all of this uh insubstantiality with something truly meaningful truly beautiful the great beauty i was looking for the great beauty is there some peach in satisfaction that at least some of the characters in this movie have reached. It's hard to tell. It's really hard to tell, and it, and it makes the movie so compelling and so uh, emotionally moving to, to just kind of wonder, like... I don't know, there's just so many examples where, where you just wonder, like, okay, but is, has that satisfied you? Has that filled that void within you that, that originally had called you to make this art? I don't know. It's all up. It's all up to you. Okay. Now we're gonna get sad again. This is an elephant sitting still. This is the only film by the director Hu Bo, 
who was a student of Bellatar before he took his own life. He finished this movie, and produced it, and released it, and I've heard conflicting things about why, um, but uh, re regardless of why it, it happened, he committed suicide. Um, it's almost four hours of just unhappy events and long disappointment between them. There's this, this spirit that we talked about in the turn horse um, of just total and final defeat that you know this is the bottom. Um, but instead of the turn horse, which kind of takes place in almost uh, a fantastical realm. <laughs> well, fantastical is certainly the wrong word, but it's, it's nothing that we can really relate to. Um, it's nothing similar to our own lives. Here, uh, we have a full picture of modernity. We, we have a, a, a world that we can relate to. Very contemporary, very multifaceted. Technology is involved. Generational splits are involved. Socioeconomic issues are involved. Um, it's all very real and very relatable and very close. And yet it achieves that same crushing finality, that same hopelessness. That, uh, that, you know, only seems sensible when it's just uh, a man and his daughter and a horse. But here, even now, with all of this, it doesn't matter. It's the same defeat. He'd really learned well from his teacher. He had, he had seen that secret heaviness of life in everything, in everyone and everywhere. And you, you can imagine Hubo's perspective just walking down the street and seeing only the heaviness of human existence in every small glimpse he saw of other people's lives. The cinematography also captures that exhaustiveness of, of Tar, but again, very multifaceted, um, just because a lot actually like happens in the movie versus Tur and Horse. Characters go places, they see things, they have conversations, there's, there's action, there's guns even, this movie's freaking crazy. Um, but all of it still has that exhaustiveness of tar, that, that thoroughness, the slow burn of seeing the entirety, of not being able to shy away, not being able to cut, nothing being cheapened. Um, the fact that Hubo was able to, to bring that energy in so many different types of scenes, so many different uh, blocking and setup and, and acting, it's really, really impressive and really brutal. The plot is very intricate, um, characters kind of shuffling through each other's lives. All of these little plot lines, slowly you realize how they'll thread together, slowly you, you notice connections between the characters, sometimes very understated. Um, a lot of, of uh, the, the, this misfortunate coincidence that these characters meet in their lowest points. This misfortune just coincides and compounds such that uh, each connection only diminishes hope further. Death and conflict are very common in this movie. There's a lot of death and a lot of arguing and a lot of just no-win situations where nobody can be happy. Um, but it never is like over dramatized. It never feels like um, you know some crisis has emerged or something bad happened. Um, but rather that it's all just this foregone conclusion that, of, of course, all aspirations, all relationships, all opportunities, all travel, it's all doomed. And such that when that doom is realized, when, when they really do hit rock bottom, you're just kind of like, right. Okay. That's right. In each character, we see small sparks of hope flutter into ash. We watch those sparks with them. They, they capture our attention, but then they fade again. So why? <laughs> why would you watch a movie this gloomy? For nearly four hours, why would you subject yourself to this? And uh, we, we used this line before when we were talking about um, it's, a, it's such a beautiful day. That, uh, and this is often what I think of when I listen to, uh, I don't know, like the microphones or Shoo Shoo. Um, that, y yeah, they're suffering. Yeah, they're really expressing the pain they feel in this art. 
But for all the profoundness and depth of that pain, they were still able to make this. They still wanted to make this. They still channeled all of that into art that it proves some enduring creative ideal that, that transcends individual suffering. Um, but here that doesn't really apply. It feels very hollow to say that because it didn't like, work for him. He made it, but it wasn't enough and he couldn't keep going. So it doesn't really yeah, you don't... Yeah. I I think... All I can say is this. It, it's simply because it is a masterpiece. You're destroyed and left in awe of what you've seen. Just standing witness to this monumental task of creation is meaningful. That's all you can say. Okay. Move on to something more fun. <laughs> At least for me, it's more fun. For other people, it could be even less fun. We got Uncut Gems, baby. Damn, I love this movie. I, I cannot get over how much I love this movie. It is just so addictive. In terms of just the sheer cinematic ecstasy, just the sheer delight I have in watching this movie, it's easily my winner of the 2010s. It's a speedball of, of that shotgunning giddy anxiety from Good Time, and then this fantastical peek into the complexities of another world and the great beauty. You get both. Both barrels just pouring into your brain nonstop. Both types of stimulation just endlessly. This, this movie is like a drug for me. Like it, it doesn't seem like it should be legal the way it makes me feel. <laughs> it, it's just too strong. <laughs> the result is an endlessly addictive film. I, I think I could literally just watch this over and over. Like we talked about how Popstar, my friend was like, hey, do you just want to watch it again? But like, th that would have its limits eventually. But but Uncut Gems, I, I cannot see myself getting tired of this movie. It just wins me over so completely. It constantly sides in this, this liminal space between between luxury and, and grandness and beauty and, and, and abrasiveness and, and uncomfortableness and loudness. It, it's always between tension and release, between having and desiring. It's perfectly unsettled and yet, yet always so clearly defined. Oh, it, it just, it's like, I, I, I'm going to say such gross things. I already said it was like drugs, but it's, it's kind of like edging. <laughs> All right, let's not talk about that. But it's, it's like, it's that same like itchy feeling, you know, that you're just like, oh, oh, it's so good. Okay, okay. It's, it's both a masterpiece of sociology and psychology. <laughs> the Wire Plus the Sopranos. I've been watching The Sopranos lately. I think I already mentioned this. Uh, when did I mention this? Oh, that was in a different video. Um, yeah, I've been watching it lately. I'm like 20 years too late, but I'm really, really enjoying it. And the thing that finally convinced me um, that like, okay, at some point I'm going to watch this. It wasn't what made me start watching it right away, but it, it was what made me like truly interested in it was a quote that my friend relayed to me from some podcast where they had said, The Wire is a masterpiece of sociology and The Sopranos is a masterpiece of psychology. And I was like, ooh, oh, you don't say. Because, you know, respecting the wire, it's like, okay, you know what's up. And then to to kind of highlight to me something that, um, like the wire sociology kind of replaces psychology, that the characters are motivated and defined largely by their social, uh, socioeconomic standing. Um, and then to think that like, oh, we could have the same complexity, we could have the same world building, we can have the same um, depth and drama and just general quality, but have it like be psychologically motivated instead of sociologically motivated. I was like, ooh, ooh. Anyways, all of this is to say though, that these two shows do each great, but this does both. This this just has both. The, 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 oh my god, the, the sociology that this movie represents is so complex. There's so many layers. So many just like huge human history stories are, are evoked 
by even just the smallest things that that your mind will just like to truly think about how these characters have arrived where they've arrived the the social forces that play behind that and the fact that they're always kind of kept at that tension of of you are only being allowed to exist like this because of x y and z um, but at the same time, uh, you, you can see, especially in Adam Sandler's character, the very personal, very interior derangement is really what is, is throwing this whole thing into a blender. Ooh, it's so good. <laughs> the overwhelming complexity of the plot is such that you end up as distraught as Howie. The, the screen cap I used um, is, is perhaps my favorite scene in the whole movie where I, I won't spoil what it is because if you're too aware of it maybe this won't work but it's like a very small plot point is shown in like the first 10 or so minutes i think and then like an hour later it's mentioned again and you can tell that howie adam sandler's character has completely forgotten and you the viewer have completely forgotten yourself even on re-watching it i'm always like oh right and and just the the like oh man i i think i think this is one of those things like how i really like anime that's set in the rural countryside <laughs> where like my past trauma has somehow reinvented itself in this extremely like cathartic release um because i used to work as like a secretary right like i worked as a, a personal assistant or, or executive assistant um so i was constantly like setting up meetings for my boss and taking messages and um i would say my, the, the worst sensation of that job I didn't like that job at all so this is saying a lot but the worst part of it was the feeling I had when my boss would ask for something I had totally forgotten about and the the sudden flashback I would have in my mind of her asking me like that very morning oh can you by the way like we're gonna have such and such a meeting can you make sure that so and so remembers to do such and such and then later her going oh yeah, I'm about to head to that meeting, has so-and-so done such-and-such, and just like, it, it's just like every drop of blood just like drains from your body, and you're just like, okay. <laughs> and then, oh man, and, and this movie is just full of moments like that, and yet because it's a movie, because it's not real, and because it's so compellingly, beautifully, masterfully depicted, I just love it. Now I love it. Isn't that weird? Maybe my brain is broken. Who cares? <laughs> I just cannot explain it. The feeling I get watching this movie is just sheer joy. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's because my dad has been showing me cringe comedy since I was like 10. We were watching The British Office when I was like a little kid. Watching Faulty Towers and, and, uh, and Peep Show and stuff. Like all these, these, like really abrasive cringe comedies it's just deep within me now the love i have for that kind of despair <laughs> everything in this movie became somehow like really insta iconic i remember when it was coming out just the the memes and the chatter and the discussion about it seemed endless uh, everything was being recontextualized as as an adam sandler meme of of this is how i win all of this stuff uh, it really feels like a stellar example of just a whole new genre of protagonist. Like, how can you compare Howie to any other character? He has, like, Shakespearean hero-type ambitions, but with this, like, weird charming and competence. He seems genuinely kind and caring in some situations. At the other extent, you feel like he is just a degenerate gambling addict that will do literally anything to have that dopamine rush. It's, it's a brand new world that they were building here, and, and, and immediately it feels like the template for everything else. The cinematography is so bold, so evocative. The willingness and stuff like just the audio mastery to have people yelling over each other the way they do. Um, and yet it's really solid and refined. It doesn't feel experimental. It doesn't feel weird. It doesn't feel like they're, they're doing something new at all, even though they really are. It feels so fresh, and yet you feel like this is a whole mode of cinema, uh, movie making that, that should have always existed. One of my favorite soundtracks, um, I, it's interesting, this is maybe my second favorite soundtrack on the list to the number one movie, 
This makes me wonder, like, am I really just rating these movies based on the soundtrack? <laughs> um, but One Tricks Point Never uh, just does an amazing job adding to this pure sensory overload with, uh, I think, some of his best music. Which is saying a lot, because I really, really like this artist. It feels like nothing like this could ever be made again. And yet, also, in the potential of how this movie works, in the sort of stories it could be told... Uh, it feels like there's just an infinite number of stories. Recently, <laughs> oh man, this is a lot to get into, but a friend of a friend is involved in this scandal where a box of first edition Pokemon cards was sold to hyper normie YouTuber Jake Paul, and then the box turned out to be fake. And now it's this huge controversy, and I, I don't really understand what's happening anymore. It's not worth getting into, but it, I realized it just has all the ingredients. All the ingredients for, like, instead of uncut gems, it would be called, like, first edition Charizard or whatever. Um, but that it would be such a, a wonderful, unique movie if the Safdie bros made it. But that these stories are just everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. Oh, man. Oh, this movie is so good. I just want to watch it right now. I've seen it so many times now. It's so good. <laughs> okay, okay. We have one more movie to talk about. I don't know if anyone can predict it. This is your last chance to make a guess. It is Liz and the Blue Bird. Hmm. Because, come on, really. For real, though. What kind of weeb would I be? What kind of weeaboo would the Keatsta YouTube channel proprietor Keatsta be if I didn't put anime at number one on this list? <laughs> This is a side story to uh, the anime series Hibike Euphonium. If you watched my anime list, uh, you saw that it did quite well on that as well. Um, but with none of the boisterousness, none of the, the drama, that, that series is all about, you know, conflicts and, and trying to see people's perspectives and um, very, very dramatic, very tense, very over the top, huge release, huge tension, whatever. Nothing like that. Instead, it's, it's a very intimate, very calm and understated movie. It explores a very, very small, but very important time and place in the lives of its characters. It operates with such restraint and minimalism and, and cast and setting. I would call it like a chamber film. If, if normal Hibike is the full-on orchestra, then this is a very small chambered quartet of uh, a flute, and an oboe, and I don't know. Uh, here's a fun, I guess you could call this a spoiler. Um, in the entire movie, there's only like two sequences that take place outside of school, at the very start and the very end. Everything else is within that one building, or within the, the characters' imaginations, of course. Because of course, yeah, there's also the storybook sequences where they show the, the story of, of Liz and the Bluebird, upon which the piece of music they're playing is based. Um, and that, I think, really nicely balances it. It has, like, that really fun Ghibli sort of animation, really uh, kind of over-the-top and action-packed and beautiful. Um, and then everything else is just classrooms, hallways. Oh, the soundtrack is also perfectly split to capture this uh, these two moods. Um, a lot of it is, like, found sound stuff. The sound of people walking, just slowly a rhythm emerges of, of water dripping, of tapping on glass. I, I don't know, I, it's, a, it's a genre that I, uh, I'm really kind of into in general, just this kind of like found sound, sound collage, field recording stuff, um, really like minimal things. Um, naive art is another genre that I'm quite interested in where it's like very simple melodies played on like a toy piano. Dun, 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 You know, just, just the simplicity of it, the smallness of it. Um, so that's like half the soundtrack. And then the other half, of course, is the recordings of their performances, which are huge, grand, deeply moving, extremely beautiful orchestral journeys. That again, I always want to iterate this when I talk about this whole franchise, because I think it's amazing. Kyoani had this music composed for the story. They, they hired composers to make something that matches the story. Then they hired a, a band, an orchestral band, 
to perform it, to, to become those characters. Um, it's just something about that realization, the way that, that all of these performances had to be r recorded and, and performed by real people, um, that, that this music really was being made with almost the same motivation as it is within the plot. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know why that matters so much to me, but every time I think about it, it's, it just seems so overwhelmingly beautiful that I just, I just want to cry. Okay, okay. The animation, of course, is just truly godly. Um, a very, very unique style in terms of uh, just the coloring and the movement and the character designs. And yet it still draws on all of KyoAni's strengths. It still uh, has, is up to their mark of quality for sure. <sighs> and after all this despair and anxiety, and this, oh, this movie is about nihilism. <laughs> this movie is about hopelessness. Ugh. This movie is about anxiety. Ooh, I'm so happy when I'm anxious. What the hell is wrong with me? Let's end on something nice. This is a truly beautiful story of epiphany, of, of making a realization that is true, that improves your life, that, that helps you understand yourself and the world better. The characters are so deeply endearing and, and watching them learn about themselves and each other is, is so beautiful and moving. Um, just, you feel so good about them. You feel so happy with how they, they learn to, to become themselves. And yeah, it's Yuri. I, I perceive a deep, deep love between the two main characters. Um, a complex love, a love that is hard to articulate and put into words, but certainly something that I would say has uh, pretty much all of the qualities that I want from Yuri, uh, which is of course a very, very special genre to me. Um, but it's also something far, far beyond the normal feelings I seek from the genre, because it's not just about like arriving at the catharsis of, of reciprocating feelings. It's not about um, escalating the relationship from friendship to lovers and, and all of the, the really tender, beautiful, sentimental feelings. And, and like it has all of it has things like that. It, it does have things like that, but but it goes so far beyond. It's so it really investigates some very deep questions that, that almost go beyond like moral questions that are just kind of like behavioral questions. What do we truly owe to one another? What does it mean to care for someone? How, how best can we care for a friend? It, it investigates these things not explicitly, not in, in explicit conversation, but in thought and emotion and action. It's developed kind of from the top down, that we see specific choices, we see how people behave and operate, that then gives away to just a flood of emotion underneath, that, that we truly see what these sorts of things mean to these people, that, and what they mean to us, the viewer, which is a lot. This movie really, really hits me. Yes. It, it puts you really in touch, I think, with the most beautiful feelings inside yourself, which are those of compassion, those of looking to the other, to other people, and having compassion for them, empathy for them, understanding them. This is a movie where all of those things are, are brought to the forefront, and in being moved by the movie, you, you feel those things inside yourself too. Which is, well, what more could you want? What more could you want than feeling like a good person? Feeling that sensation of, I want to be a good person. I want to have a beautiful life. I want to feel like the things inside of me are beautiful. Yeah. All right. That's it. We made it through the list. Very happy to have made this list. Fix that. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy with the list, I gotta say. I think there's a good variety of movies. I was able to talk about um, some, some really complicated feelings I get from movies. Um, I think it really does capture the movies I, I liked best, that, I, that meant the most to me in this period.
Um, so yeah. Thank you for joining me. Please look forward to... Maybe next we'll do video games? The video games of the 2010s? That'll be fun. Alright, bye-bye.